Good afternoon and welcome to our series of webinars focused on bringing you information about COVID-19 related topics. The information in these weekly webinars is geared toward long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, but we encourage everyone who's interested to attend. Today we'll be discussing appropriate use of PPE under the current guidelines. Everyone has entered the meeting on mute, but we will have a discussion at the end of the webinar. If you have questions or comments, please submit them using either the chat or the Q&A tool in your Zoom menu. We encourage you to join us every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for more of our weekly webinars. Next week, we'll be discussing NHSN updates. My name is Kathy Caudill. I'm the Communications Specialist with Quality Insights, and now I'd like to introduce our guest, Cindy Wandling. Cindy began her nursing career in 1982 as a CNA at a long-term care psychiatric center. Since becoming a registered nurse, she has covered a multitude of specialties, but eventually returned to her first love, the long-term care population. She has served as Director of Nursing, Clinical Consultant, Director of Clinical Operations, and VP of Clinical Quality Operations. In recent years, her specialty has been regulatory compliance, overseeing 60 facilities covering six states. Cindy joined Quality Insights earlier this year, continuing her career-long goal to ensure long-term care populations receive the best possible care. Uh, Cindy, welcome back. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so you've got your presentation up on the screen. If you're ready, you can take it away. Wonderful. I always like to have the presentation on the screen. That's always questionable when I start one of these webinars. So thank you, Kathy, um, for the introduction. And as Kathy said, you know, long-term care is my love. And I think one of the most important ways we can take care of our patients and our residents is through observing infection control practices. Today, we'll switch gears quite a bit. Um, you'll see from the overview here, let me switch my page appropriately. Oh, no, Kathy, now it's not. Is it freezing up? No, I think you've got your mouse there. There you there go. I go. There I go. Thank you. Um, we're going to do a brief overview of standard and tr transmission based precautions, just simply because if you're like me, when COVID came along and we rapidly changed some of our practices, I wonder to myself, do I remember the basics? So I thought it would be a good idea that we touch base on and remind one another of what are standard precautions and what are transmission-based precautions and ask ourselves, are our staff still aware of those cru crucial precautions in their daily practice? Also, we always keep an eye on what's happening with COVID-19. We're gonna touch base on prevention and therapeutic treatments. And then I want to briefly introduce Project First Line. So we appreciate you being here today. We're going to move on to standard precautions. Standard precautions are a set of practices that we apply giving care to all of our patients in all healthcare settings, um, regardless of their suspected or confirmed infectious state. It's really an assumption that we need to protect ourselves and protect our patients using the basic standard precautions. Um, they include a group of preventions, and those are the use of hand hygiene. And hand hygiene cannot be stressed enough in infection control, whether it's your alcohol-based product or it's your soap and water. Uh, the use of gloves, the gown, the mask, your eye protection or face shield, depending on the anticipated exposure, and safe injection practices. Um, it's interesting standard precautions during patient care is determined by the nature of the healthcare personnel patient interaction and the extent of anticipated blood, body, fluid, or pathogen exposure. And examples given by the guidelines for infection prevention, which were updated in May of 22, um, were, for example, for performing a venipuncture, you may only need gloves. If you're in a situation where you are performing an intubation, which we do not do, or rarely I would think we would do, unless you're in a, in a ventilator building, the use of gloves, the gown, the face shield, and the goggles is necessary to protect both yourself and the patient. One thing my, my personal um, practice has taught me that you need to know the patient, and I think it's very important when we teach our frontline caregivers, and we give them um, the appropriate PPE to wear in a room is every patient is different. 
you may have a likelihood where you can be splashed with one person and you may not be splashed with another, thinking changing foliage or even um, providing tube feeding. So those are consideration when we post our signs and we talk to our staff about what needs to be applied to the patient as far as standard precautions are concerned. So education and training are crucial. And that's a big bullet point I wish I had put on here is know your patient. Know what that anticipated exposure may be at the time you apply your interventions for standard precautions. So I learned something. I don't know if I learned it or it was recall when I was researching for this PowerPoint that there, there are some new over the years. There are some new um, guidelines that were put into place and placed under standard precautions because we are all familiar with them, but they've always been practiced under the standard of care. And those will be one that I'm practicing now, which we all know our respiratory hygiene, our cough etiquette. Um, we knew it before COVID came along. We knew it when people ran around with the sniffles, the common cold, the congestion, a respiratory illness that maybe you can't put your finger on. And we're seeing more and more of those, even with COVID and the flu and things that they now swab for. I'm sure in your own communities, you've noticed that um, more and more of your, our emergency departments are full, the urgent cares are full. So cough etiquette and hand hygiene or, some, or respiratory hygiene, excuse me, are something we just can't forget about right now. And there are some reminders under respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. We need to educate our facility staff, our patients, and our visitors as well. And in the seasonal or sometimes not seasonal um, areas or communities may be experiencing these signs and symptoms. Maybe there's a cluster. Maybe you've heard from your local health department. You want to go ahead and make sure that you have out what's needed for your respiratory hygiene, your, your tissue, your signs posted to explain to the public and our patients how to practice respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. You'll notice at the bottom, spatial separation in respiratory hygiene is greater than three feet. We all know with COVID, we really like to hang back about six feet. One that was added also are safe injection practices. As studies were conducted after an outbreak of hepatitis B was identified, uh, in a particular area in the country. And what they found is that the injection practices were not compliant with the standards of practice. So they placed that in standard precautions. Surprisingly, this is what happened. They found that the breaches were in um, reinsertion of used needles into multi-dose vials or solution containers. And also that the use of single needle or syringe were, were used to um, administer intravenous medications to multiple patients. And that really makes me cringe. And I'm sure it really makes you cringe too, but it reiterates the importance of what we for years considered to be a standard of practice really need to be hit uh, in our education and onboarding process in our centers to make sure that we're sure people don't follow these aberrant practices. I even added lumbar puncture. I doubt any of our centers perform lumbar punctures, but I will say as advocates for our patients, as advocates for our families and ourselves in healthcare, I think it's important that we know um, as group and healthcare providers that a face mask should be worn during an epidural and during any type of lumbar puncture. And that is now in the standard precaution guidelines. Switching gears. Transmission-based precautions, practices, and PPEs. We always start first in all infection prevention practices, washing our hands. We always apply standard precautions. Transmission-based precautions are practiced when we know and there's documented or suspected diagnosis of infectious um, materials, the person has an actual infection or is suspected to have an actual infection. And we use standard, and there's three different categories that you add, contact, droplet, and airborne. So they're implemented, standard-based precautions are implemented when patients, or excuse me, um, are used when routes of transmission are not completely interrupted during standard precautions. This can be in the interest of, this can be, uh, for an example, would be SARS, and you implement your transmission-based precautions. 
when used either singularly in combination, they're always combined with standard. And I should have put, I wish we could see everybody on here and I keep looking at my pictures. So I apologize. I like to see, I can see the panelists here, but um, the Appendix A that we're also familiar with, the CDC Appendix A, um, it's fun, but that is actually the reference for when to apply what particular standard-based precaution goes with what infectious process. And it's really important, and I'm sure all the nurses on here are familiar with it, but reference that when you're considering what additional practices and precautions to put into place. So contact precautions we're really familiar with, and the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, in my mind, is, is C. diff. We know that if someone is diagnosed with C. difficile, we add the gowns and the gloves for all contact with that person and that person's environment. Donning and doffing. Um, donning PPE upon entering the room and discarding appropriately before exiting the room are important in contact precautions. And you'll notice a couple of times in this presentation, I say, know your facility's policy and procedure. And there's a reason for that. And I'll share that reason when we get to the overview of COVID. So droplet precautions. Droplet precautions require a mask, not an N95. Again, in this day and age of COVID, um, we need to make sure what is our facility policy and that we post appropriately at the door the precautions to be used. We know that when we have COVID in a center, we use N95s. That's not considered to be droplet precautions. <clears throat> That's actually airborne precautions. So keep that in mind again with education with our staff. Airborne precautions, excuse me. Sorry about that. Airborne precautions uh, prevent the transmission of infectious agents that remain infectious over longer distances greater than the three foot. We know the six foot when we practice in COVID. Um, they're preferred for patients who are in airborne, excuse me, their preferred placement for patients who are in airborne precautions is in airborne infection isolation rooms. We know that we don't have those in our centers and we've adapted accordingly when we care for the COVID patient. In settings where it's not possible to have airborne precautions and they can't be implemented, we do know, and this is source control that we deal with with COVID, is we mask the patient as well when appropriate. They're placed in a private room with the door closed. Um, provide the patient an N95 mask or higher level. Now keep in mind, airborne came about long before COVID and usually we think about the positive TB that intermittently pops up in a center um, after admission, we find out they're positive and you take these steps in your healthcare setting to protect yourself, your staff and other patients while you make appropriate um, plans for that particular patient. One thing that's really important with airborne precautions at any time we utilize uh, an N95 mask, that mask is donned prior to entering a specific room. There are also OSHA requirements and standards this is something that can easily fall through the crack when the manufacturer of the N95 changes uh, from your suppliers. We need to remember there always has to be for that N95, a medical evaluation, a fit testing, a training, and other elements that you can find in OSHA's respiratory protection standard. So every center should have that policy in place to make sure that we're fitted appropriately with those N95 masks. So when to change your N95? <clears throat> we'll come again to the statement, know your facility policy. N95s are meant to be disposed of after each use. According to the CDC, there are circumstances where the N95 can be removed before leaving the room or after leaving the room. And the link is here. Um, to an actual CDC demonstration of donning and doffing the PPE. Frequently questions are asked about wearing the same N95 mask from one room to the next. When we talk about COVID, we'll talk about that practice and how important it is to, to know what the CDC says and to follow your facility's policy. We do know that CDC 
actually um, provided strategies for optimizing when there was a shortage. To my knowledge, um, there is no longer a shortage of approved N95 masks. So we need to keep that under consideration. Those were the days when we were fortunate to have surgical masks or um, the KN95 from other countries that were not FDA or OSHA approved. So keeping our eyes on COVID, when we talk about PPE practices, your facility may still have that internal red zone where you house only and only positive patients in an area that is zoned out to the rest of your center. Your staff doesn't go from one area to another. It's completely contained in that area. I say know your center's policies. They could have changed with all the changes in CDC um, recommendations that have been made in the last two years. You want to know what does your policy say for that red zone? Keep in mind that even if all of your patients who are COVID positive are held in a red zone, placed in a red zone, you still have to practice the appropriate PPE for each patient. So if I am across the room from Kathy, I'm gonna use you Kathy, I can see your picture. Uh, across the room from Kathy, and Kathy has COVID and nothing else to be concerned about, you may be able to go from my room to Kathy's room with the same N95. But if I have the flu and COVID, you must change out your PPE as you would any place else in your facility. I mean, replacing it all. Um, if your residents are maintained in place, the practice is to single use PPE. That's the safe way to do it. So, and do we have any questions about that? I wonder, I see a q and I'm not really sure, Kathy. Uh, yes, the Q&A says, we've had a lot of conversation about enhanced droplet precautions for COVID positive residents. We made our own signs stating enhanced droplet precautions requiring N95 or higher, or higher level protection. Is this acceptable? If your policy supports that, yes, yes. Um, I think early on when COVID, nobody really knew what to do with all the new recommendations uh, from the CDC in managing and handling. So I think as long as your policy runs in place, what you call it is quite all right, as long as people know it applies to a particular infectious disease and follows the recommendations from the CDC. And then another thing to consider for your patient, and I did uh, give Jennifer Brown, our infection preventionist, a call on this. I um, have had conversations with centers who are of the mindset that, well, Cindy and Kathy are in a room together. Cindy's positive for COVID. Kathy inevitably will get COVID. So what's the point in moving Kathy? Well, the point is she's not positive. So, um, Think about that, read your facility policy. It is not appropriate to expose a negative patient to a positive patient. And that sometimes creates issues, um, particularly if your census is full. That's when your team meets, your interdisciplinary team, your interprofessional team, and discuss the appropriate placement that presents the, the least risk to your resident population. So Cindy, we have another question here. Mm -hmm. It says, so do we not need a specific red zone? I'm gonna to defer to your facility policy. Um, I can follow that up specifically with whoever asked that questions with the recommendations. And also it's dependent on which state you practice in. I practice in the state of West Virginia right now, or, you know, I work with the centers in the state of West Virginia. Um, other opportunities are available for your um, COVID positive patients. So um, I'm not sure your state, but in West Virginia, there are, are other options. 
Um, your best bet is always to reach out to your local health department and ask for guidance and insight. So with all that, and COVID has been probably the most confusing um, infectious disease I've, I've dealt with in my professional career. And I think we could all shake our head yes, the, anyone that's been in it for a period of time. But as always, implementing the appropriate infection prevention practices that pre prevent the spread of an infectious disease should be everybody's priority every day when they walk into a center in particular. Prevention is always the best medicine. So when we talk about the medicine, we know that every center is challenged with COVID fatigue. Um, I don't want one more shot, but we also know and studies have cho shown us that being vaccinated and being boosted significantly decrease the severity of COVID-19. And that is what we all want to see for our patients. You know, they may not spurt COVID-19 forever, but by obtaining the bivalent booster, which is now the most recent booster, we know that we've protected them to the extent possible and reduced the opportunity for harm for that patient. And that, that can't be stressed enough. Um, so please, please, please reach out to us if you're, out of ideas, reach out to your um, quality uh, improvement specialist. If you're out of ideas, we discuss it frequently. Don't necessarily have all the answers, but we try really hard to look for best practices. If you have a high vaccination rate, up to date bivalent boosters in your center, reach out to us and share what practice you have in place so we can share with other centers in the state. How did you get there? It's a real challenge. So while we consider how we, we want to prevent it and provide the best care possible, we also want to consider how do we treat people therapeutic in a timely manner. And you'll notice that this is a screenshot and it's a screenshot for a reason. Um, we don't know tomorrow if a new therapeutic treatment will come out. However, at the bottom of this um, page, you will see what are the possible treatment options. It came from the Administ Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response and it is updated in a timely manner. So it will be in this resource for you to reference. So Project First Line, I don't see any more questions about anything so far. Project First Line is really interesting. If you've not gone to the Project First Line site on the CDC, each state health department has a Project First Line program. And the intent of Project First Line is to be innovative and accessible to educate infection, educate our frontline employees and healthcare workers um, to infection control practices. It's COVID, it's non-COVID. Uh, there's short snippets, they're easy to access, and they're intended to be used in day-to-day -day operations. Um, and we're gonna actually demo one here shortly. Uh, Kathy will be in charge of that. But it offers a variety of infection control education programs from a high level overview to a, um, for someone like me, tell me what I need to do and do it, tell me in 10 minutes what I need to do. So um, it takes both approaches to that. I think you'll enjoy the, the overview we'll do here shortly. This is just a simple overview of um, using the right PPE at the right time. And Kathy and I will work through that momentarily. In this, you'll note that Pennsylvania Project First Line, West Virginia, and the CDC, all of those sites are the same. They may look a little bit differently, but the education is the same. And all of the resources for the presentation are in place here. I thank you for your time. Does anyone have any more questions? All right, if you have any questions, please enter them in either the chat or the Q&A box, or if you would like to ask your question audibly, you can raise your hand and then we can uh, give you access to unmute yourself. Um, if you will look in the chat, you will see that I have dropped in a link to the Project First Line website that we're going to do a demonstration in a minute. Um, I also said that if anyone is wanting the recording or slides for this webinar, I will email it later this week to everyone who is here today using the email address that you registered with. 
And before we continue on to our q and I wanted to remind everyone that next week's webinar will be discussing NHSN updates, and that will be next Wednesday at 2, and we hope you can join us. And if you ever want to talk further on these topics but prefer one-on-one -on -one discussion, we invite you to join us during our office hours, which are each Tuesday at 8 a.m. and Thursday at 2 p.m. And uh, we have the links to those as well as the webinar in our Friday newsletter that goes out every week called The Last Minute Lowdown. If you would like to receive that newsletter but don't think you're on the mailing list, you can email me at ccaudill at qualityinsights.org and I'll get you on that list. If you need to contact Cindy, her email is cwandling at qualityinsights.org and I will drop our emails in the chat shortly if you need to get in touch with either of us. And it looks like we have some stuff in the Q&A. Um, are there any options for treating COVID positive residents who need beds crushed but have dementia and won't leave an IV in place? Wow, that's a big question. Read that one again. Let's see. Um, any options for treating COVID positive residents who need meds crushed but have dementia and won't leave an IV in place? So is the question related to their um, COVID status? Um, let's see. So the, the residents are COVID positive. Um, they need meds crushed. Now I'm supposing, do you think they're talking about therapeutics there? Or Possibly. just med medicine in general? Um, and won't leave an IV in place. So Judith, who submitted that question, if you have any elaborations, or if you'd like to raise your hand to be able to audibly ask your question and clarify. Um, Cindy, do you have anything to say? Um, no, therapeutics, I think that is the, the, the people that know your patients best um, are you. I think that the most important thing to do um, instead of try to problem solve that one alone, would be to one, I would be interested, um, anyone in the group can respond to that question when you have the patient who, and I'm thinking we're talking therapeutics, how do we get the therapeutics in if we can't do an IV, if we can't do uh, the oral medication um, with or without um, the tube? So Cindy, the, the hand is raised, so I'm going to allow Judith to talk. Um, Judith, I think awesome. you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm referring to therapeutics. I have a resident with cognitive impairment. Chew, chewed. We did try to give Paxlovid. She chewed it. We had to stop it. Um, and, you know, it, she's not a candidate for IV medication. So is anybody working on, you know, oral uh, liquid antivirals, for instance, or something that we can give to people with cognitive impairment to better facilitate treatment? I think that's a fabulous question and I don't have the answer, but Judith, I will um, actually reach out to a couple of folks and see, uh, you know, that that's a really, um, that's a really high level question. If there's yeah, any this yeah. is the problem that we're running into in nursing homes. You know, we're being told that we're not treating enough people with COVID, but we don't have the option to treat if they have cognitive impairment and they can't take whole pills. Uh, that's that's a fabulous question. I'll reach out um, to a contact at the West Virginia Board of Pharmacy today and see if she's aware of any therapeutics um, under development that would be in a liquid form and, and more realistic for the, the cognitively impaired patient that can't um, otherwise take the therapeutics and I'll, I will let you know or we'll, I'll send it to Kathy maybe and we can get it out in the email for the people who attended today. Thank you, appreciate that. That's a fabulous, yeah, that's a fabulous question. It's much like some of our folks that we're not able to, um, include in all of our vaccinations because they may not have a representative or they we may not be able to have that crucial discussion about how important the, the vaccinations and the boosters are. Um, and then 
it, it reflects on on any any number of reporting. So I think that's an excellent question, and I'll get with her today. All right, Judith, I took down your question and your information so we could email you directly. And then if uh, Cindy has anything in time for when I send out that recording email later this week, we can let everybody else on the call know what answer she comes up with. And I will say this, um, Judith, the we will have the director of the West Virginia Board of Pharmacy on January 4th, isn't it? Yes, that's right, the 4th. Um, it's Christ Kathy, Christa Kate yeah. Hart. Yes, if if you can make that the CEO webinar as well, she'll be a great source of, of uh, knowledge for us. All right, so that's all the questions we have so far, but we're going to move on to this uh, demonstration of the Project First Line website, if that sounds good to you, Cindy. That sounds great. This one is, is truly really simple, guys, and I apologize for the simplicity, but I think it's important to see how, how you can do this in a very short period of time and maybe clear up some questions that, that staff may have. And if anyone has any more questions that they wanted to get in before the end of the presentation, you can keep dropping them into the Q&A or the chat. So this is choosing the right PPE for COVID-19. And again, it goes back to our signage, to our individual patients um, who may need what. So if you'll click the arrow. Okay, recognizing and responding to risks appropriately are the best ways to protect patients and yourself from germs that spread in healthcare. This is Shanice. She's a nurse at a local hospital. Let's consider how Shanice uses personal protective equipment, PPE for infection control. And this is a good time to mention that this site is also for the population. So it's out there for everybody to see. It's, it's not overly complex. So Shanice has to check on a COVID-19 patient. Help her select the correct PPE to wear when caring for a COVID-19 patient. So gloves, when we click gloves, you see she gets a green check. Click on booties. Kathy, do you think she needs booties? No, she doesn't need the booties. And we can see this as, as simplistic as it is, but at the same time, if you work in more than one facility, and we know that there are agency staff that we have, the policy will be different from agency to agency. And I've actually gone to centers early, well, not so well, and not too long ago, where they had booties at the door. And I didn't know because I wasn't in that building on a routine basis. Okay, I know that booties don't belong in the COVID PPE list, but does the center require me to wear booties? So that's where you can use some of this and integrate it into your onboarding um, for new employees and people working in different centers in this day and age. And that happens a lot. So you, you notice that when she clicks, it's green. And if there's a wrong answer, it's the red. So very simple. So we can go on to the next page here. And when you do present this, you do have to do the narrative with it. Obviously they can do it themselves. You can assign educations or you can use these short snippets just really in staff meetings to go over some of the basics. And this tells us we were right. We did a great job. Next button. Then it goes on to talk about the N95 respirator. Um, and it goes, it talks about the seal and checking the seal with each use. And we're not gonna continue to go through this. I think that you can see how simple it is, but let's ask the true or false questions. So now let's review some questions about Shanice's use of her PPE, true or false. Shanice should do a user seal check whenever she puts on an N95 respirator. I'm gonna let you guess, Kathy. It's true, it's a true answer. And I think we've all seen in centers, in our own centers and visiting other centers, folks just slap on that N95, hand it all, and go to work without the seal check. Again, these are just good reminders. And I think that's probably sufficient, Kathy, for a demo. They also have short videos. They have longer 20 minute sessions, hour sessions. I would encourage you if you're running out of ideas for your staff education and you need a different toolbox, maybe a different method, that you do go onto your state's website for Project First Line and uh, look at some of the available education. All 
All right, I'm going to stop sharing if that sounds good to you. Sounds great. Okay. Um, it looks like we have another q and A in in the Q and A box, and we also have someone whose hand is raised. Okay. Uh, so first, let's go with the hand raised. I will allow you to talk, and if you would like to ask your question now, you should be able to unmute yourself, Michelle. Can we unmute her if she's not? Um, she can now unmute herself if she would like. She raised her hand a few minutes ago. Um, maybe she doesn't remember that her hand's raised. Sometimes people accidentally click that. Oh, I've done that before. Yeah. You know that. Um, well, in that case, let's move on to the question. Okay. Uh, they asked suggestions uh, when you find yourself bedlocked with COVID positive residents in with COVID negative residents. So I hope I read that well. Suggestions for when you find yourself bedlocked with COVID positive residents in with COVID negative residents. I've been there. The only advice that I can give is the team internally needs to sit down with their medical director, um, clinical leaders, and other folks on their interdisciplinary team and determine what placement puts each resident at the least amount of risk. Different organizations have different guidance and guidelines for that. So you, there's no easy way to speak globally. So I would seek um, advice if you um, have a regional support team, I would seek advice and input from that regional support team. Um, if you do not, again, it's really important to get your um, medical director at your center. And I would also reach out to my local health department for recommendations and support. Does that answer appropriately for the Pennsylvania centers, ladies from uh, Pennsylvania perspective? Yes. Jennifer said yes. You, you definitely wanna get your local health department involved, your center leadership, your regional and corporate leadership if you have that available. There's no blanket answer for that. And it's a very difficult situation to find yourself in. And that's it for the questions that we have so far. We might take another moment. Um, Michelle, I see your hand is still raised. I've given you the ability to unmute yourself, but I'm not sure if you actually had a question or not. But you have another minute here to ask your question if you have it. And then, of course, anyone can also follow up with us afterwards. I put my email and Cindy's email in the chat. And then, as I said, I will be emailing everybody later this week with the presentation slides and uh, the recording to this webinar. So I will have our contact information there, too, if anyone needs to get in touch with us that way. And I think we can wrap up here for today. Uh, Cindy, I'd like to thank you for joining us again. And I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us again. And I hope you all can join us again next week. Thanks, Kat. Thank you. Bye. Bye.